Hello and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews, we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime, and I'm really looking forward to starting a new family discussion with you today about the New Orleans Mafia. Despite what many believe, New Orleans was actually the origin of what we know as the American Mafia today. And I figured that today in this place would be the best time to dive into the city that does not get as much attention as its flashier counterparts. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to the Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss about New Orleans, so let's get right to it. When you think about the Sicilian-American or Italian-American organized crime in the United States, you probably think about New York or maybe Prohibition-era Chicago. New York specifically seems to own the narrative when it comes to this specific branch of crime, but New York wasn't even the first city to experience the Old World's version of organized crime in the United States. Before New York, and before the American Civil War, the particular brand of organized crime we have come to use the blanket term of mafia to describe really started in the swampy trade area of America's Big Easy, New Orleans. So what got New Orleans started in organized crime and how has it grown since then? To begin, let's discuss the area itself. When Napoleon Bonaparte began finding himself in a pinch between impending conflicts with Great Britain and slave revolutions in Haiti, he was happy to negotiate the sale of the Louisiana Territory with the United States. In 1802, President Thomas Jefferson was happy to send future President James Monroe into talks with France to secure a purchase of land that doubled the size of the United States, which came to be known as the Louisiana Purchase. The Treaty of Agreement of Sale was made on April 30th and signed on May 2nd. This purchase was ratified in October, and in December of 1903, France transferred authority to the United States. What sort of interesting is of the states fully purchased with the Louisiana Purchase? Louisiana was not one of them. In fact, in the state of what is present-day Louisiana, only some of the state's land was purchased. It would not be until April 30th, 1812, that the state of Louisiana would be the first to be carved out of the Louisiana Purchase, making it the 18th United State. A major win for Jefferson was not only the enormous westward expansion, but also the purchase of New Orleans. With the purchase of New Orleans and the income the United States could now earn through the city's major port, Jefferson secured economic progress for all of the country, but specifically the United States Gulf Coast region. In addition to that, New Orleans was a cultural melting pot between African, Native American, and European cultures. Many slaves were sadly traded in New Orleans from Africa, Haiti, and Europe, making the city, even if not by choice necessarily, an extremely diverse area. Some of the immigration in the area was voluntary, of course, which further added to the city's eclectic makeup and unique history. Founded by French colonists in 1718 and made a U.S. city with its purchase in 1803, New Orleans was the third most populated U.S. city by 1840 and was the largest city in the antebellum South. It was after the Civil War that Sicilian immigrants, specifically those from Palermo, would gain a foothold in the city's organized crime. After Sicily successfully broke away from Naples in 1848, Naples regained control the next year. Due to the oppressive policies, heavy taxation, and economic ruin, many Sicilians fled to the United States and the majority of them came to New Orleans. Between 1884 and 1924, over 290,000 immigrants from Italy, specifically Sicilians, would move to the Paris of the South. The Civil War would last from 1861 to 1865, but a year before, in 1860, two immigrants very important to our story today arrived in New Orleans, Raffaele and Joseph Agnello. Raffaele Agnello was born in 1830 and immigrated with his brother to New Orleans in 1860. The Agnello brothers, descendants of Palermo aristocrats, were already involved in Sicilian organized crime back in the old country and brought that attitude and influence with them to the United States when they settled in Palermitani, New Orleans' Little Palermo. The Agnellos would spend their time earning loyalty in these communities, quickly becoming a powerful regional family and bosses of Palermitani in a similar fashion to the Palermo family bosses structure back in Sicily. Politically neutral in the Civil War, when Union soldiers began taking over the city in April of 1862, the Confederate soldiers, New Orleans police, and politicians made a run for it. This left Palermitani unprotected, so Agnello stepped up as the leader of the Italian's Guard Battalion, the Italian branch of the European brigade in the state militia, in which Agnello was already a prominent member. This would keep order in the French Quarter and docks. When the Union soldiers realized that Agnello was a neutral party, they let him be, and by the end of the Civil War, they were relying on his battalion for assistance. After the Civil War, many former slaves moved from Louisiana into metropolitan areas where they could do more than field work. This left an opening in agricultural work that would soon be filled by Sicilian Americans and immigrants willing to do what it took to improve their station. Many Sicilian immigrants flooded the area and gave rise to a much more powerful Agnello, allowing him to expand his influence outside the realm of Palermitano. 
colony. New Orleans was being rebuilt post-war, and now Aniello would be on the ground floor. Aniello was not the only Sicilian to find opportunity in organized crime in New Orleans. Most of the initial Aniello powers started off political, doing favors for families in the neighborhood, making sure associated friends got good deals on produce, shop locations, shipping locations, etc. Soon, of course, this would expand into prostitution, something for which New Orleans is unfortunately known even to this day. Aniello wasn't the only pimp and political favor distributor in town, though. As the Italian, specifically Sicilian, population of the city continued to grow, more competition emerged from the humid, subtropical climate. First and foremost, it should be noted that an influential fruit merchant in the area, Joseph Maceca, not only did not have Aniello's favor, but would openly oppose him. Maceca was considered the wealthiest Italian businessman in New Orleans with his shipping operations, most of which owed its success to the produce shipped from Honduras. At the beginning of Reconstruction following the war, Maceca had been an important political leader. He and his workers, the Innocenti, many of whom came courtesy of the Sicilian exodus from the old country, were known for their corruption, specifically when it came to street fighting. Macheca would later work very closely with Salvatore Matranga as he established the Stupaghieri Mafia ring in the French Quarter. More on Macheca and Matranga later on. The Stupaghieri Mafia was based out of Monreale, Sicily, but, much like Cosa Nostra and the Gomorrah, would aspire to expand their power into the United States. Matranga would soon be the head of his own Stupaghieri family, which mostly operated in several small groups, all under the boss's control, similar to Cosa Nostra's structure. As boss of the Stupaghieri gang, Matranga would oversee a panel of three underbosses, or sotocapi, who would oversee a crew of leaders, capo de China, who oversaw about 10 soldiers each. In addition to the Stubaghieri movement and the resistant merchant, other non-Palermo Sicilian immigrants would find that they had a taste for Creole corruption. Gangs stemming from Trapani and Messina, Sicily, would be fighting for French Quarter headship as well. Under Macheca, the Trapani, Messina, and occasionally Stupaghieri members would find common ground and work as Innocenti for Macheca's political purposes and for rooting out Agnello and his Palermitani men. Agnello did not want to lose his control, so he initiated the firing of the first shot in what would soon be known as America's first First Mafia War, Litero Barba, of the Messinian and Ochente variety, would be shot in the chest and killed on October 28, 1868. He was only 27 years old at the time and an ally to Macheca's cause. Because of this, many suspected at the time that the young man's death was at the hands or from the orders of Raffaele Agnello. The newspapers and Agnello initially blamed African-American cigar maker and state legislator Octave Below. He was part of the Republican Party and the Innocente were part of the militant Democrat wing. While this did occupy the Innocente for a time hunting for Below, it was ultimately determined that Agnello was either to blame or involved. And as further witness testimony came forward, it became clear that Below was not responsible. The portions of the Innocente originating from Trapani and especially Messina began to not only realize that Agnello was behind the murder, but that he had his man Alphonse Matteo pull the trigger. In an effort to settle the tension with the Messinian and Ocente, Joseph Agnello took on the responsibility of hosting a December gathering and party for them to take some of the heat off of his brother. The party was held at his home and consisted of half Messinian and Ocente and half Agnello men from Palermitani as a demonstration of unity. Salvatore Mantranga and his Stupagheri uprisers were also invited to the event but opted out of attending. A smart move. The party started out well, but mixing alcohol with rival gang factions was probably not the wisest decision. Messinian and Ochente member Joseph Bonanno, not to be confused with Joseph Bonanno in New York, who wasn't even born yet and has nothing to do with this story, got Alphonse Matteo alone to squeeze him about Barba's murder. Matteo was not expecting this type of encounter. He would reach down to pull a knife from his holster beneath his pant leg, but Bonanno was quicker on the draw and pulled a pistol on Matteo, shooting him through the face and neck. This caused all of the Messinian and Ochente to draw their weapons and begin firing as they fled the mansion. As the Innocente were leaving, Raffaele Agnello took very careful aim and shot Bonanno in the back. He went down and his colleagues picked him up and carried him off. Believe it or not, both Matteo and Bonanno would recover from these injuries and be back to work with their respective bosses before the end of the winter. With Macheca's backing of weapons and money, the Messinian and Ocente were prepared to go to war with the Palermitani. After these shootings had taken place, most commerce in the French Quarter had been halted for fear of violence. The Messinian and Ocente, under the leadership of Giovanni Casabianca, even had killers at the ready to take down the Palermitani, but the Palermitani got word of this and stayed out of the area. This gave the impression that the Messinian and Ocente had won the conflict. They may have won the day, but they had not won the war by any stretch of the imagination. On the onset of this mob war, the immigrants of Palermo origin who had been working under Macheca, whether for political reasons, shipping work, or mob muscle, 
would switch to on yellow side. He had been the biggest advocate for their people, and they would not take up arms against the man who was referred to in Little Palermo as Uncle Raffaele. Realizing that in yellow had the type of loyalty that could not be paid for, and after having secured the position of winning the day after the shooting, the Messinian faction wanted to get back to normal, but in yellow's Palermitani men, wouldn't have it. The conflict continued apace. The Palermitani men would take back the French Quarter and send many of the Messinian men to Galveston, Texas, another budding immigration hub for men from Messina, Sicily. That wasn't enough for the Palermitani men, though. Joseph Agnello, Alphonse Matteo, and their men would lead an ambush on February 15, 1869 to push Messinian leaders Giovanni Casabianca and Joseph Bonanno into Galveston, Texas, where the Palermitani men would continue to terrorize them and plant the seeds for their eventual expansion into Galveston. After a month, the Messinian gangsters would try to inch their way back into the French Quarter and started at the Poitras Market. However, Agnello's men found out about this quickly and sent a group of men led by Joseph Agnello to take care of them. Neither men from the Messinian nor the Palermitani side were seriously injured. The conflict ended prematurely when an innocent bystander, grocer David Clark, was shot in the neck and seriously injured. He would die as a result of the gunshot wound 10 days later. The people in the Poitras Market were outraged by the Sicilian violence and demanded justice. Somehow, Agnello's men were able to wiggle out of the charges, and the Messinian leaders, Pedro Lucho and Giovanni Casabianca, who had drawn their weapons to defend themselves, would become the fall guys for the crime and were sent away to the Orleans Parish Prison. At the end of March of 1869, Macheca and Agnello sat down for a peace meeting and agreed to settle this gang conflict between the different Sicilian factions. It would seem that both men had left the table feeling good about the peace agreement. On April 1st, 1869, Raffaele Agnello, who had been in hiding and done all of his communicating through his brother Joseph and his bodyguards, specifically his godson Frank Saccaro, felt safe again and returned to his favorite activity of walking through the Sicilian neighborhoods and being adored as Uncle Raffaele. Agnello was wearing his best suit for his stroll, complete with a bowler hat, diamond tie clip, and walking stick. He, followed by his bodyguard godson, strode through the marketplace and gleefully accepted the praise of the area's citizens. Everything was back to the way he liked it. As Agnello and Saccaro were walking near the bakery on Toulouse Street, they heard a commotion from behind them and turned to see what was going on. When they turned back, they were met by a bald, bearded man holding a gun to Agnello's head. Saccaro reached out his left hand to stop the man, but the trigger was pulled, injuring Saccaro's hand and killing Agnello, who now lay dead outside the bakery. Several bullets were volleyed between Saccaro and the shooter, who quickly ran away from the scene. Some of these stray bullets injured Saccaro, and one struck the unfortunate baker in the leg. When the police arrived, Saccaro gave them a description of the shooter. After about two months, the police apprehended the shooter, Joseph Florida. However, Florida would be let off the hook. After all, Saccaro was Sicilian. He told the police he did not recognize Florida as the shooter. Technically, the Raffaele Agnello murder remains unsolved to this day. After Agnello's murder, there was a power vacuum that opened up, and Macheca saw his chance to take control of the French Quarter. He began funding Salvatore Matrenga's Tubaguete crew to get the muscle he needed. He wanted the type of loyalty that Agnello had, and thought that by paying to build up the Stubagieri, it would be possible. He continued to recognize Matrenga as the Stubagieri leader, and folded his men from Trapani and Messina into the crew, even though technically this crew had its origins in Monreale. One of the main men who rose up in resistance was Raffaele Agnello's brother, Joseph Agnello. With the help of his man, Salvador Rosa, Joseph Agnello was able to finally pull the trigger and successfully kill Joseph Bonanno and Pedro Alucho on July 22, 1869. Agnello would escape the authorities for the murders, but Rosa would be sent to the Orleans Parish Prison, where he would die of an illness. The implication with this seems to be that Rosa was poisoned. Even though Agnello's vendetta against Alucho and Bonanno were satisfied, the gang war continued, and he was not in any position of strength. Those who remained loyal to the Agnello name and or stayed in New Orleans were met with bullets to the head, covering the Big Easy streets with blood. Agnello would successfully avoid an assassination attempt in early spring of 1869, as well as a stab wound in the chest the same year. After surviving the second attempt on his life, Agnello was met with a third attempt. This time, a rifle blasted through his chest and arm on September 13, 1871. While these wounds were initially believed to be fatal, the third time was not the charm in taking out Agnello. He survived and would soon be back on the streets leading the Palermitani resistance. In April of 1872, the three-time assassination attempt survivor Joseph Agnello had had enough and entered into peace talks with one of the Stubagieri's top men, Joseph Maresa. This meeting went really really poorly. The next morning, the men were fist fighting and wrestling each other on the Ficayune Pier. Agnello managed to get away and take off running after three men came to assist Maressa, one of whom was Joseph Florada, the primary suspect in the shooting of Raffaele Agnello. 
As Daniello ran for cover in The Boat Named Mischief, if this were a novel, critics would say that that name was too on the nose, you can't make this stuff up. As he ran to mischief, gunfire was volleyed back and forth between him and the four Stubayeri men until Agnello got onto the boat. In the crossfire, a little boy, Edward Nixon, received a flesh wound and recently married customs inspector Joseph Simon Sude would be killed. Marissa was finally able to board mischief and deliver a fatal gunshot wound to Agnello's chest, with the bullet blasting through his heart and coming out from his back. Agnello fell, but stood up and took two steps toward his attackers before finally dying. After Agnello died, the Palermitani resistance was toast. Alphonse Mateo left New Orleans with his wife and daughter, and Frank Saccaro and his family left for Dallas, Texas. Much more violent than the Cosa Nostra or other Sicilian Mafia factions, Stupagheri participation was mandatory. If you were in the Sicilian district of New Orleans, you either paid up, left, or your disfigured remains would wash up in the canals. The Stupagheri now controlled New Orleans organized crime, and it's on this cliffhanger that I'm going to leave you until our next episode. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the origins of the New Orleans Mafia. Many of you had recommended that I study New Orleans for my next segment, and I'm so glad that you did. Not only was New Orleans the first origin point for the Sicilian Mafia in the United States, but it's also the city in which so much bloodshed, power, and corruption is involved. And we're going to be discussing all of that in the weeks to come. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about the Sicilian Mafia in New Orleans. Also, don't forget to utilize the comment section in social media to let me know who you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao!